The four, the hidden DNA of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google by Scott Galloway. Now this book refers to these huge firms as the four horsemen, and they're all powerful, but they're actually not all good. We have the perception that these large companies are actually creating lots of jobs, but really what they're doing is creating a small number of highly paid jobs, and everybody else is fighting over the scraps, which actually puts people out of jobs. If you think Google representing the brain, Amazon, which is powered by robotics, links the brain to the acquisitive fingers, which utilizes a hunter-gathering instinct to actually acquire more stuff. Facebook is the world's connective tissue, and it's a combination of behavioral data and ad revenue that underwrites a Google-like mammoth. Everywhere else, you'll see lots of positive things written about Steve Jobs, but this book shines him in a different light. And it suggests he wasn't actually a particularly nice man, not paying child support, for example. However, what Steve Jobs did that was perhaps his best decision was actually transitioning Apple from a technology brand to a luxury brand. And this is perhaps one of the best um, consequential value-creating decisions in history. See, the iPhone, which has really defined Apple's success, was in fact not the thing that's created Apple. It's actually the value from the design of their shops and being able to actually scale and be timeless. So, for example, Chanel may well outlive the shining meteor that then sets Google on the path to extinction. And Apple at the moment is the only of the four horsemen that have actually thrived post their original founder and management team. So what makes a luxury brand successful? Well, in terms of luxury, part of it is buying something. It then triggers an emotion, a boost of serotonin that makes you feel some happiness and success. And rich people are actually the most homogenous in any group of well, cohort on earth, because they all just obtain the same luxury brands. And it's this act of obtaining a luxury brand which tries to make you in part seductive to strangers, and it releases that serotonin in your head. And it's that kind of sexual magic of a luxury brand that doesn't actually often work. Many Apple owners would sleep alone at night, for example. But what's worth I've got an Android phone. Nonetheless, what are the five attributes for a luxury brand? An iconic founder, artisanship, and that's really the skill in that particular craft. Vertical integration, and that's when the company actually owns the supply distributors and really can control the whole chain very well, so it can control the customer experience. Fourth would be global reach, and fifth, is having a premium price, and they use scarcity to their benefit. Facebook taps into our needs for relationships and helps nourish them. And there's something satisfying, potentially, about connecting with a friend we have not seen for 20 years. And you get this hit in your brain of dopamine. And Facebook can actually analyze every bit of data about ourselves. Everything that you look at, even if you don't like or share it, it knows what you're thinking. And in potentially, this can mean it knows you more than your close friends do. And the challenge is that then Facebook can utilize this data to build an extremely accurate advertising profile of yourself and sell that to other people. And ultimately, all these platforms they want to do is monetize their audience. And it's actually suggested that the algorithms that power these are potentially the most lucrative things that man has ever made. It's of note that social marketing has moved away from the what we'd call social marketing, and that you've clicked a like on something, therefore you may want to buy it and instead it's changed to behavioral marketing and that is based on actually what you've been searching for. So what gives these four horsemen 
the competitive edge, well, let me outline six ways. The first is that they truly differentiate themselves by not having to resort to expensive yet dull advertising. So they're truly unique. A second is they have visionary capital, and that actually has an ability to attract cheap capital by articulating a bold vision that's easy to understand. They also have likability, and fourthly, they obtain global reach. And fifthly, they can control that customer experience through vertical integration that I mentioned earlier. This book suggests that Samsung is never going to be cool, and it, that would be the same if it's ever featured in a Best Buy store. I'm a proud owner of a Samsung myself, so you can read whatever you like into it. They also recruit the best talent. This is the smartest people around. And with that, emotional maturity is very key. The digital age worker actually has to respond to numerous stakeholders, shift between different rules on a very rapid cycle. And it can often have highs of success, lows of failure. And somebody who's able to manage that enthusiasm and have the emotional maturity to do this is extremely important. If you're wanting to progress your career, this book suggests that for every four things you're asked to do, you should do one additional bonus thing, an, an extra deliverable, go in that mile beyond. And also, it's important to determine what you're actually good at as early as possible and then commit to becoming great at that. You don't have to love it, but when you ascend the ranks, you may love other things that go around being great at something. So it really is suggested not to follow your passion, but instead to follow your talent. It's obviously important to keep physically fit you're less prone to depression, you can think clearer, sleep better, and broaden your pool of potential mates. And on a regular basis, there's the suggestion that at work you should demonstrate both your physical and mental strength, which is known as grit. And ownership is another standout skill for building your career. You should become obsessed, more obsessed than anybody on the team with getting things done that are needed to be done. And don't assume anything will happen. In fact, you need to also almost think about the tasks, the project and the business and make sure that it's all getting done. This does pose a challenge to how you interact with people. Unsurprisingly, how you interact with people is crucially important. It can determine the projects, the opportunities that you get, who you work with and who actually wants to hire you. And this brings in that additional aspect of going to university or aka college and that's that it's not just the education you get it's the network that you can potentially build there because some of your friends from university may sure drop off a cliff in terms of their career progression others however may be extremely valuable if you can utilize them in future with the potential networks that they have possessed and it can help you and them in their future endeavors. Just remember though, if you want to get rich, the path to richness is living below your means and investing in income producing assets. Becoming rich is more of a function of discipline than how much money you actually make. I enjoyed how they mentioned the legendary Grant study from Harvard Medical School and it was a longitudinal study tracking around 268 male Harvard sophomores and it was quite a while back between 1938 and 1944 and they measured so many things and it was trying to look to see what factors determine human flourishing. And they looked at many things like personality traits, anthropological, physical traits, personality traits, IQ. They even measured the hanging length of um, the gentleman's scrotum. I, I'd love to see that in more detail, just the data, not the actual pictures, 
and see if another analysis could be done from that. But that's sidetracking. The point is that it actually found it was the depth and meaningfulness of people's relationships that was the strongest indicator of happiness. And in conclusion, happiness is love. Love is a function of intimacy and the depth of the interactions we have with people. Please don't relate that to the depth you may obtain from your scrotum hanging length. That would just be not the point. When you're being successful, just remember there's this thing called regression to the mean and it's a powerful force and don't let this capture you. You see what lots of entrepreneurs mistakenly do, they make lots of money and then they, the mistake they think is that that's because they're really good at something and then their next venture may turn into a big loss and it's because they were thinking the initial success relied upon their genius rather than a fair share of good luck. And at the same time, when you're not doing so well, being beaten down, realize this. Don't think that you're stupid and never feel bad about yourself because it may just be a bit of luck going in the opposite direction. Thinking about startups, they go through different cycles. And crudely speaking, you've got the startup phase, the growth phase, the maturity, and then the decline. And each of these startup phases and the phases of a business require different skills from the leadership. You've got the initial entrepreneur, then the visionary, then the operator, then the pragmatist, the pragmatist. And it's actually hardest to find pragmatist leaders. It's possibly the harder word to say as well. But the entrepreneur is the storyteller who can convince people to join and invest in the company before it really exists. And highly rational and intelligent people are often not very good entrepreneurs, especially serial entrepreneurs, because they can actually see the risks. But once the firm's gathered momentum and it's got access to capital, it's better served then by a visionary person um, who's able to turn this momentum into a somewhat dumbed down but scalable business that can mature and reeks of integrity. And you've got to, at that point, be very competent at dealing with employees who increasingly want their job security over risk and who prefer salaries over stock. Then you, that's when you're operating the business. And then the final CEO, the pragmatist, actually is often a completely different person. The key is that it may be a different CEO is better for a company at a different time in the, the, the company's life cycle. Because in the end, you need somebody who doesn't uh, have romantic notions about the, the firm. They realize the glory days have gone and they want to harvest as much cash as they can. That would be cutting costs faster than revenue declines, and seeing what valuable assets are still available and potentially nurturing them and selling off the rest. So, a lot of information there. Feel free to l comment below. I'd like to hear what you think. Like, subscribe, and I shall see you next time.